The Legend of Zelda is a franchise that has been going on for a very long time, starting all the way back in 1986 on the NES. The original Zelda was very ambitious, dare I say, pretty really rad. rad. Just throwing you in an open world with no directions. You're free to go wherever you want. There are also tons of secrets hidden in the world, some I have no clue how you find without a walkthrough, but I'm sure it led to a great sense of discovery at launch. Zelda 1 was something truly special when it released. It even came in a gold cartridge back in the day. Then Zelda 2 came out the following year and was pretty different. Most of the game was played in 2D, which means combat and dungeons were drastically changed from the first game. You can still find heart containers and whatnot by exploring, but that's really where the similarities end. Also, it's probably the most forgotten game in the series for how different it is. Four years later, one of the best games in the franchise came out. The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, an evolution of what made the first game so special. But instead of having the whole world to explore, some parts are blocked and you'll need to get items from dungeons to move forward. Also, there's an actual story this time, with tons of characters to meet along the way. Ocarina of Time would take that template and push it to 11, bringing Zelda to fully 3D on the N64, revolutionizing the series, and it was beloved by everyone, becoming the highest rated game ever made, truly a masterpiece in gaming. The Legend of Zelda would follow this formula for many years, until Breath of the Wild. Or rather, Zelda Wii U as it was known in the 2014 reveal trailer. And holy shit, is Link a girl now? So that was a fucking lie. Later that year, at the Game Awards, they would show off the first gameplay of Breath of the Wild, and it looked very ambitious, going back to the roots of the first Zelda where you could go wherever you like in an open world. However, it would be a couple of years before we'd see the game again as it got delayed out of 2015. But, at E3 2016, Nintendo would show off one of the greatest trailers ever. Is this boy climbing a whole ass mountain? I don't know if it's weird for me to get nostalgic about this trailer, but I can remember exactly how I reacted every time I go back and watch it. My mind was blown. There were probably tears at one point as well. However, they finally revealed the name. No more calling it Zelda Wii U. This was The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild now. I was extremely excited from this point forward, impatiently waiting for more info. Luckily, the next showcase was just six months later, which felt like years to me at the time. We got to see more of the cast and heard more voice acting, which is a series first. Saw more of the beautiful world, and above all, the game finally got a release date. March 3rd. With it being just a couple of months away from launch, I was ecstatic. I hadn't seen anything like what was being shown. Every day from then forward felt like weeks. Until the fabled day arrived, and I didn't get the game until a few days later. Nevertheless, it was in my hands at long last. And man, it was love at first sight. Because when you can't find love in real life, turn to the next best thing. I was so happy to be playing the game, and it seemed like everyone else was as well. It was getting near-perfect scores across the board, and people were posting secrets they found, clips they made, or thirsting over Link. Which, like, can you blame them? <laughs> My friends and I were all experiencing the game differently, from the order we did things, seeing stuff the other hadn't, or how we got around the world. It was awesome! A couple of weeks after launch, Nintendo started putting up the Making a Breath of the Wild videos on their channel, where they talk about what went into developing it and concepts they had before getting the game we know. Like a goddamn alien invasion! They also made a 2D prototype for it to test the physics and I want to know who I have to talk to at Nintendo to play it. There's so much cool concept art too, I highly recommend giving it a watch if you're even remotely interested. This game holds a very special place in my heart, and there's a lot I want to talk about and share about this game, so hopefully you'll stick to the end. Can't believe these words are finally gonna leave my mouth, but... Welcome to The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. 
The game starts with a mysterious voice telling Link to wake up, and the first thing he does after waking is check his tablet. These kids and their social media, man. She then goes on a rant about how you're the only hope to save Hyrule, but that can wait. I have a world to explore. I'm free! Oh, never mind then. Although the Great Plateau is just a small part of the map, it still feels pretty big, and it's a very good tutorial. It gives a small taste of what the world will be like, run down and in ruins. After learning that Link has been asleep for the past 100 years and Calamity Ganon has taken over, you're free to do whatever you want on the Great Plateau. Whee! There is a lot to do and find on the Great Plateau alone. Don't mind me, I'm just gonna steal your stuff. Hold on, are those what I think they are? You could explore for hours before even setting foot in the open world. After completing the four shrines and getting your runes, Gramps gives the rundown of what happened to Link 100 years ago. Yeah, he got fucked up. They resurrected you, dude. The least you could do is say thank you. The open world is now yours to own. It's all just one big sandbox, so let that imagination of yours go wild. Breath of the Wild. I'll see myself out. Anything you can see, you can go to or climb. You can even go straight to Hyrule Castle to kill Ganon, but why would you do that when there's so much to discover? The first thing you'll probably want after getting off the Great Plateau is a horse, because you don't want to hurt Link's legs, and it's also just not that great running on foot considering you run out of stamina every two seconds. There are different kinds of horses, ones with spots on them, ones with two colors, and full colored ones, which are often harder to catch than the previous mentioned ones. If you run out of stamina trying to sue the horse, it will boot you off. However, if you are successful, bring it to a stable and register it, or it will despawn if you get too far from it. The horse will be stubborn sometimes, so make sure to pet it and feed it to max out its bond. You can also change the horse's mane and mane color if you're not a fan of its look. Scanning the Twilight Princess or Smash Link amiibo for the first time will spawn a Pona in case you miss her. The game doesn't mark anything on your map aside from main quests and side quests you started. Other than that though, you have to find most things out on your own. However, to get a better lay of the land, there are towers to climb that fill out a portion of the map. Not all of them are as easy as just climbing it though. Sometimes you'll have to figure out how to just get to the thing. And some were made by Satan himself. I loved the sense of discovery, not knowing anything outside of the trailers released, and finding side quests and references to the previous games was a great feeling. I wish I could experience this game all over again. Wait, holy shit, is that the Master Sword? Well, don't mind if I do. Oh, never mind. Since Link's brain got all banged up after dying, he lost all of his memories and doesn't know who anyone is, or even who he is for that matter. You have one picture to go off of for each memory, everyone giving a better look at Link's relationship with the champions and Princess Zelda. God damn, how could you ever forget that though? Although I think the story definitely isn't the best in the series, I do like how Zelda and Link are portrayed. You get to see the ups and downs they had together and the struggle Zelda goes through trying to awaken her power. It's nice to see them actually interact and talk with each other. Well, her talk, I suppose. Also, if you go to Hyrule Castle and make your way up to Zelda's study, you can read her secret diary, where she talks more in depth about her relationship with her father and Link. She hated Link at first, but eventually got to know a bit about him, like his love for food, and eventually grew fond of him. I wish they fleshed out some more of the characters in the game, like the Yiga clan who we get to know almost nothing about. I think it's pretty obvious they're anti-Sheikah since their logo is an upside down Sheikah eye and they tried to kill the princess, but not much is known outside of that. Even after invading their hideout where you kill the leader of the Yiga, who may I say died too soon, you still learn nothing. They remain a mystery. I thought the champion's descendants would have played a big part in the story, but unfortunately you don't really get to know them at all. They kind of just help you get to the Divine Beast and then you peace out and go to the next one. It was a bit of a bummer. As you explore the perilous cold of Hebra to the treacherous heat of Death Mountain, you'll discover a lot. Like the huge leviathan skeletons where it's like, what the fuck happened that wiped out these huge beings? Or what in the world created this giant footstep? And then there's the mystery of Satori, the Lord of the Mountain, who only appears once in a while. And I like to believe it's supposed to insinuate Satoru Iwata is sitting up there watching over the land. Which is a very bittersweet thought. 
Honestly, Breath of the Wild's world building is my favorite stuff in the game. Just the amount of stuff that goes unanswered and it makes exploring this Hyrule more fun and mysterious. However, whenever it starts raining, exploring sucks. Constantly slipping down whatever you're climbing is pretty rough. If only Link had the Song of Storms to stop it. You'll also find a ton of side quests, most of them being pretty basic and bare bones, which is to be expected in a game this scale. However, I wasn't expecting to like or even love some of them. There's one where Link becomes a homeowner, and I love putting the champion weapons on display. The family is all back together. Sort of. The side quest then evolves into building a whole ass town and finding people to join it. And the ending to it, which I won't spoil, almost made me ugly cry. It honestly might be my favorite side quest in a game, hands down. You also get to save a malice-covered dragon, and it honestly made me want a more fleshed out boss fight like that, because it was pretty fun. And of course, there's the classic of grabbing Kukos. Some things never change. Mini games are a Zelda staple, it's basically not a Zelda game without them. Luckily, Breath of the Wild is no stranger to them. From attempting to get a hole in one in golf, to deer hunting in the forest, or snowballing in the cold of Hebra, there's lots of variety to be had. Unfortunately, the rewards are just rupees, which granted are very important. But for me personally, I didn't find any reason to do them more than once or twice because there are a lot easier ways to get rupees than that. However, they are still fun enough to go back to every once in a while. Oh no. Oh, n no, please, not you. Burn! Koroks are scattered all throughout Hyrule, rewarding you with a seed after finding them. That could not have been comfortable. There is a whopping 900 in total, which is both good and bad, because on one hand, the average casual player will be able to get lots of slot upgrades by just coming across them. On the other hand, it's a nightmare for completionists. It'll drive the average person insane. And what's your reward for getting all 900? A golden piece of shit that does absolutely nothing. The Legend of Zelda is also known for its banger music like Hyrule Field from Ocarina of Time, the main theme of Wind Waker, or of course, the overworld theme from the original game. However, Breath of the Wild went for a more minimal approach to the music, only having themes for the major towns and stables, obviously during combat as well, although the battle theme does get pretty stale after a while. But no music plays while traversing across Hyrule, just the ambience of the world around you. Birds chirping, wind whistling, and sounds of the sea, and sometimes a few ambient notes of a piano, which I did like during my first playthrough. But after going back to previous entries, it made me ache for more music in the game that's not just a few piano notes. There are none of the traditional dungeons we've grown to love from the Zelda series. Instead, you will take on the Divine Beasts, which were built by the Sheikah long before the events of Breath of the Wild, to combat the revival of Calamity Ganon. Each one is piloted by one of the four champions, or rather, were piloted by the four champions. Calamity Ganon was much stronger than anticipated and was able to corrupt and control each of the Divine Beasts, placing a very fearsome boss in each of them that killed the champions. So Link's gotta go and do some cleanup. A hundred years too late, but better late than never, I suppose? You can tackle them in any order you see fit, but they're not exactly ecstatic for the company. With the help of the champion descendants, you'll have to rough it up a little before you can get inside. In each one, you'll have to get to the five terminals by solving puzzles, and that's it. They all look very similar on the inside, aside from being a different animal. They're pretty underwhelming. The bosses are also quite lackluster. Yeah, I kind of lied about them being fearsome, but it was for dramatic effect. They look relatively the same, but have different movesets, but you're pretty much fighting the same boss again and again, which is quite disappointing. However, it is nice to have one final heart-to-heart -heart with the champions after defeating the boss. They're also kind enough to give a helpful ability as a parting gift, along with the weapon they used. Rivali's Gale creates an updraft sending you high in the sky, very helpful if you need a bit of extra height to climb a mountain. Herbosa's Fury helps if there's a bunch of enemies surrounding you since it's a big lightning AoE that does good damage and stuns them for a bit. Daruk's Protection, as the name implies, protects you from danger. It can even stop you from taking fall damage. Last but certainly not least is Mipha's Grace which helps you get down for mountains easier. 
Not really. If you die and Mipha's grace is up, she will revive you with full HP and a few extra hearts if you have room. Alright, let's try this again. Are you fucking kidding me? The Sheikah also built the shrines a long, long time ago to help prepare the hero for Calamity Ganon's return. You'll find them all across Hyrule, and you know you're close because the Sheikah sensor will start beeping louder. You can always turn it off if it's too annoying for you. The shrines will put you through various trials, whether it be a test of strength or having to solve a puzzle, which I will say I'm pretty surprised with how many different puzzles there are. I figured they would repeat a lot more than they do, but there's a good variety to them. However, my favorite shrines are the ones that you saw from the outside to unveil it. Like having to ride a deer and bring it to this platform, showing this girl who likes balls a little too much pictures of guardians, or finding the remaining pieces to the Mirror of Twilight. How did it get here? Who knows, but it's a cool reference regardless. I do want to shine some light on my favorite shrines in the game. Eventide is super cool. Upon arrival, you'll be stripped of all the weapons, food, and outfits acquired up to that point, and you have to try to survive and get the three orbs into a hole, which is very challenging since everything does a lot of damage. But it was a lot of fun. It gave me the same feeling that the Great Plateau did and was such a cool thing to run into on a first playthrough. The seven heroines are gigantic statues found in Gerudo Desert, each to said to have a unique power. You have to match the balls with the symbol on the statues. However, the interesting part comes from the rumored eighth heroine. Yes, I know it's a side quest, but they kind of go hand in hand, so I'm gonna talk about it now. Somehow the eighth statue ended up broken and quite far from the others, which adds some mystery to them. Like, how did it get over here and why is it broken? It's one of the things I love about this Hyrule. There are certain things that are big mysteries but are never answered. You gotta come up with your own theory. It's so fucking cool, man. Of course, if we're talking about shrine quests, how could we forget about Flower Girl? Oh. Uh oh, she really isn't happy about that, huh? After completing a shrine, you'll encounter a monk who spouts some nonsense and then gives you a spirit orb, which you need four of to upgrade either your health or stamina. Also in Heiteno Village, there's this little demon statue where you can trade stamina for a heart or vice versa. Another neat thing about the shrines is that most of the names are anagrams of the developer's names, which is such a sweet detail. Alright, let's try this one last time. Oh. Oh my god. I did it. Woo! The combat in Breath of the Wild is probably the most controversial thing in the game for one reason. Well, multiple, but the main reason is because of weapon durability. But I found the gameplay loop to be quite fun even with its flaws. So allow me to explain why I think the weapon durability really isn't that bad. There are a lot of weapons in this game, from a tree branch to limbs to some sci-fi looking stuff. No matter where you go, you'll probably find one or a few just lying around. Every single enemy also carries a weapon, and they'll drop it after being killed, so you always have a plethora of weapons at your disposal. Some enemies like Lynels and Hinoxes can make you go through multiple weapons, but usually drop some pretty powerful stuff. With the champion weapons being very special, it feels awful when they break. However, with a diamond and whatever weapon you need, they can be rebuilt. The only time I somewhat agree with durability sucking is for the Master Sword, but at least you can use it again once the cooldown runs out. Also, enemies respawn after the Blood Moon, so you can go back and get the OP weapons again. The Blood Moon also scared me the first time I played. That shit is so menacing. The combat is very simple, but effective. Perfect dodging and parrying is pretty satisfying, especially after getting a flurry rush, which lets you deal lots of damage. There are a few ways to face a camp of enemies. You can go in guns blazing, or try to be stealthy. Sneak strikes are quite OP, they basically one-shot any enemy or 
close to it. You can even use the environment to your advantage, like dropping boulders on them. It's very fun to try to come up with creative ways to fight. Where Breath of the Wild's combat falls short for me is the lack of enemy variety. You can probably count on two hands how many there are, which definitely gets boring after playing for many, many hours. And it definitely made me not want to engage with the combat after a while. The mini bosses also leave a lot to be desired since there's only two of them, Stone Taluses and Hinoxes. Neither of them are really that tough either. However, a couple of the enemies put up a good fight, mainly the Guardians and the aforementioned Lynels. Well, Guardians actually aren't that tough once you get a shield. Alright, bring it on, you ain't ready for my f- Huh. Alright then. A good tip to know for fighting Lynels is that stunning them will let you mount it and hit them from the back which doesn't take away any durability. Or you could just use an ancient arrow I guess. Poof! Just like that. Back to guardians who are actually pretty scary, once that music kicks in you know you're fucked. However, they are their own worst enemy because the guardian weapons do extra damage to them. They really didn't think that through when arming them, huh? Alright, let me try this again. Yeah, it doesn't feel so good, does it? Another thing you'll want before going into battle is food, since it's the only way to regain hearts. They can also give temporary hearts or various buffs like attack up, movement speed up, or defense up. Elixirs do the same, but they're made from monster parts and don't heal you. Link can dress up in a multitude of outfits in Breath of the Wild, which help Link's fragile little bones not shatter at the slight touch of a bokoblin. Most also give various buffs like silent movement, faster climbing speed, or running at the speed of sound only at night. You can go to the Great Fairy to upgrade almost all of the outfits, beefing them out a little bit. Oh, I'll leave you to it then. Some of them can even be dyed a different color if you're not a fan of how it looks. And goddamn I love a few of the outfits. The Vogarudo set is so badass. It also changes how Link's hair looks, which very few headpieces do. I like the ancient gear for the same reason, you get to see a peak of his hair down. Obviously I love the champion's tunic, it's a nice refreshing look for him. But Link can also dress in his classic green tunic if you complete all 120 shrines. Or you can don the past hero's clothes by using their respective amiibo. I wish I had the young Link amiibo because Fierce Deity looks so good in this game, man. While we're on the talk of amiibo, exploring can get a bit lonely without a companion. Luckily, if you have the Wolf Link amiibo, you can summon him in-game and he'll travel alongside Link, battling with him. And he looks so cute! Look at him! Let me pet him, please. If you have Twilight Princess HD and do the Cave of Shadows, Wolf Link will have as many hearts in-game as your save file. Now, on to the DLC, which was split into two waves. Wave 1 added a few new armor sets like the Phantom Armor from Spear Tracks and the Korok Mask which helps you find Koroks. The biggest additions were the Trial of the Sword and Master Mode. Returning to Korok Forest after obtaining the Master Sword, you can put it back in the pedestal to start the trial, removing all food, armor, and weapons. You have to go through multiple floors, clearing enemies, and this was a lot of fun. But very stressful because if you die, you gotta go back and do the whole thing again. Just don't do them back to back like I did. It's not good for the brain. At the end of each trial, the Master Sword will get an increase in damage and the final trial awakens the full power of the sword, also giving it more durability. Master Mode has always sounded fun to me, and on paper it should be. However, the execution isn't that good. I only played around 4 hours of it, but that was enough for me to decide that I just didn't want to play anymore. I do like that they changed the enemy placement, like putting a fucking Silver Lionel on the Great Plateau. He's just standing there, menacingly! Unfortunately, everything else doesn't really work. Enemies are tougher, so they take a lot more to kill, especially since none of the weapons early game do good damage. Their health also regenerates after a few seconds of not taking damage, which I don't like. I would have preferred it just being mini bosses and bosses that regenerate, not regular enemies. Most of the time you get one shot anyway, so I mostly just avoided fights because there was no reason to. I know I could just stealth around and play that way, but I personally don't like playing that way, so this mode just wasn't for me. 
Wave 2 added even more outfits and a new story expansion called the Champion's Ballad. Going back to where it all started, the Shrine of Resurrection. Putting the slate back where you first picked it up will activate the trial. Upon grabbing the one-hit obliterator, you'll be tasked with eliminating groups of enemies to reveal shrines. The catch is, Link dies in one hit as well. I don't know why this DLC is so much more challenging than anything else in the game. Or maybe I'm just bad at video games. Who can say for sure? After cleaning up the Great Plateau, congratulations, you got more tasks to do. Each region will now have a mysterious shrine looking thing extruding from the ground, and Cass is there to sing you a little song about the trials of each location. I love Cass and I'm glad he has more of a role to play in the DLC. During the base game, Cass left his family to fulfill the core poet's final wish. You can read about his journey in this shack in Wash's Bluff. Upon completing the trials and shrines, you'll get spirit orbs for the corresponding champion, and obtaining them will net you one final memory with said champion and reduced cooldown to each ability. This has all been leading up to the final trial, which is another divine beast. God. Damn it! I thought we were done with these. To give a little bit of credit, I did find it a bit more puzzling than all the other Divine Beasts. It even stumped me a few times. And they also didn't make the boss a Blight Ganon. Thank God. I actually quite enjoyed this boss. It has some pretty cool moves, like cloning itself. Maz Koshia is also pretty quick, which most bosses aren't, so that was also pretty nice. I'm just really glad they did something new that worked, and until the second phase happens where Maz Koshia just becomes really big and slow. Basically just a reskinned Hinox, and it's a lot less interesting than the previous phase. Completing this final trial, you'll get the best reward ever. A photo with all the champions that you can put in your house. Along with a sick ass motorbike. Riding around Hyrule on a motorcycle feels so cool. Screw a Pona, watch this sick flip, Ganon! Speaking of Ganon, I do want to talk about the final boss, so this next part is going to be huge spoilers. So if you don't want to know anything, skip to this time frame. As you make your way up towards the castle, you'll face a bunch of powerful foes. As if Hyrule Castle didn't look abysmal already. But you get to hear a sick remix of the Hyrule Castle theme and I love it so much. It had no right going this hard. Upon reaching the sanctum where Ganon lies, he'll shoot a barrage of lasers, breaking himself free, flopping onto the floor and shattering it. Falling where the true battle takes place. But before he can even get up, the champions release the full power of the Divine Beast and unleash complete and utter hell upon Calamity Ganon. Link then draws his Master Sword and the battle commences. I actually quite like this fight, it's pretty cool. Although he doesn't have a lot of moves, he's also not that difficult, so it doesn't really have that final boss feeling. After finishing Calamity Ganon off, his malice starts pouring out and he fucking explodes, moving himself to Hyrule Field and taking the shape of Dark Beast Ganon, ready to absolutely demolish all of Hyrule. However, Zelda isn't letting that happen and gives Link the Bow of Light, and this fight is pretty underwhelming. Zelda will mark glowing points on Ganon and you have to shoot them and that's it. He doesn't really feel like the threat he was said to be because all it takes is a few bow shots to finish him off. It's very disappointing that enemies such as Lynels are harder to fight than the final fucking boss. However, I do quite enjoy the ending. Zelda and Link finally reunited after a thousand hours of doing stupid shit, and Link gets to be by her side as they journey together and try to rebuild Hyrule. Breath of the Wild will forever hold a special place in my heart after religiously following every aspect of the game for years and it still managing to blow every expectation I had out of the water was incredible. The fact I could play the game for hours and hours getting lost in the world without getting sick of it, few games have managed to grab me in such a way since, and it's still the best video game I've had the pleasure of experiencing. It truly feels like a once in a lifetime experience and I don't think I'll ever forget it. Honestly, I was kind of hesitant to make this video because it feels like I'm saying goodbye to one of my favorite childhood memories and games. Anyways, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for watching. 
I've been trying to work on this project for the better part of a year, and after many, many drafts, I finally wrote something I'm proud of, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did making it. This is by far my favorite video I've ever worked on. I feel like I say that every time, but that just means I'm improving. Seeing as I poured every ounce of my body into this, don't expect another video of this scale for a little bit. I need some time to recover. However, I still have other videos on the way that you can look forward to. I'm gonna go hibernate now. Bye bye. <laughs>